Okay. All right. How are you? Good. It's been a busy, busy day and week. Yes. Uh, your audio is breaking up, but is mine okay? Oh, uh, yeah, yours is fine. Is it still choppy? No, now it's better. What happened? I don't know. But it's better. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, do you want to uh, go ahead and share your screen with your slides so we can get started? Hi, I'm Tom Zimmerman. I'm a member of the research staff and a master inventor at IBM Research in San Jose, California. And I work with the Center for Cellular Construction, which is the Consortium of Universities and the Exploratorium funded by the National Science Foundation. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey into science, uh, what you do? So I'm an inventor and I consider I've always been an inventor because I've always loved, even when I was a little boy, taking apart my toys and learning how things work and drawing ideas for inventions. And uh, when I was a little boy, I played baseball and I wasn't really good. So they put me in the outfield. So I would wander into the, into the woods and I saw rocks that had uh, little shiny things. And when I was young, I thought everything that was shiny was gold. So my first invention was a gold machine. And all it was, it was just on paper. It was two wheels with teeth. And you put these rocks, which I thought had gold on it, and it would crush them and have a bucket on the bottom. So it was a concept, but it was along the lines of what inventors do is see things and think of new uses for them. And, uh, and so I've grown up since then, and <laughs> some of my inventions work. Um, but it's the same basic principle. You can invent things by need, that is uh, like, Common needs, think of uh, if you've ever tried to open a tomato jar and it's really hard to open, that's a problem. So that's asking for an invention. But there's another way to invent that I like is uh, if you say, wouldn't it be cool if dot, dot, dot. And I thought once, wouldn't it be cool if you could just do this and make believe you're playing guitar and really hear it? And that led me to invent the power glove. Um, but today I wanna to talk to you about an invention I started um, about 14 years ago and I'm still working on it. Um, and it was basically from playing around with digital cameras. And so as an inventor, I, I studied science, I studied physics and a little chemistry, um, mechanical engineering, electronics, and so basically anything you learn, I think is really useful for being an inventor. Uh, so that's the adult in me. I studied a lot of science in high school and college, but I also retained the kid part in me, which I think is really important, just playing with things and observing. So I wanna show you what happened. Okay, so um, what uh, about in about 2007, the cost of digital cameras got really inexpensive. Um, so I usually buy two of things, one so I can use it and one so I can take it apart and find out how it works. <laughs> and I did that with all my toys when I was a kid and my parents were really good. They didn't yell at me for taking my toys apart because um, that's how I learned how things work. Okay, so back to 2007. So digital cameras got pretty inexpensive. They were down to $30, so I bought two. And I took one of them apart and let me show you, oh, you see my screen here. Uh, this is the image chip. In the old days before digital cameras, we had film and the film would be exposed to light and it would burn the image uh, onto the film. But um, this one is, the, this is a digital chip and uh, it's about as small as my fingernail and it's, it, it has thousands and thousands of little light detectors. And so um, when I was a boy, I used to do black and white photography. And on the top left here is what happens when you take enlarging paper and you put objects on it and expose it to light. And those are called photograms. And I used to do that as a kid. And so I thought, oh, well, 
this is sort of like enlarging paper, but instead of being eight and a half by 11 inches, it was only about a quarter of an inch uh, small. So I needed really tiny objects to put on top of it. And so I, I knew that salt crystals were cubed, cubes. So I put some salt on it and I needed a, a light source to shine. And I happened to have a light source handy, that red light on your uh, mouse, that was handy. So I held it above. Uh, an inventor is always resourceful. <laughs> You're just grabbing um, whatever is around. Exactly. I needed a light and I, oh, well, well, here's a light. And so I held it above and I looked on my computer screen um, and I could see the salt crystals, but they were kind of boring. They just sat there. So I grabbed some um, rubbing alcohol I had and poured it on it. I, I used alcohol because I knew it would evaporate fast. And what I saw was this picture. And so that's the kid in me playing around. But the adult in me said, what are these streaks that I'm seeing? And I was very curious and I thought about it. There's no lens here. You're just seeing the shadows. And but what's causing these shadows? And I realized the adult in me said, wow, what you're seeing is um, salty alcohol has a different index of refraction. That means how it bends light. It has a different index of refraction than pure alcohol. So what you're seeing is the salt is dissolving in the alcohol and it's changing the index of refraction. So anyway, so my physics background told me this is really interesting because you wouldn't see this with an optical microscope because um, it, it is not sensitive to these small changes of index of refraction. So you're wondering why is that important? Well, it turns out um, seeing small changes of index of refraction is really good for a microscope. So here's my salty crystals, my salty alcohol water. This bottom left is a picture using a regular microscope of these little creatures called plankton. And these, this particular version of plankton is called a rotifer, uh, which is fascinating in its own right, but that's another story. Okay, so here's, here's a picture of lots of rotifer and I labeled them. And if you notice the rotifer labeled A is in focus along with its buddies B and C, but you notice all the other ones are fuzzy. And if you've ever taken a picture, you know, you have, you, it has to focus on the person and then the back, the people in front or behind will be fuzzy. That's called depth of field. Well, that's, that's what's happening here. I, when you focus on A, B, and C, all the other ones which are higher or lower because they're in water are out of focus. And notice that most of it is clear, only the very center, which is called the nucleus, um, you can really see uh, because it has a lot of uh, materials in it, which uh, are pretty dense compared to the rest of the body is made out of pretty much just water. But then look at this blue image. This one is, I took a, a camera, a much better one. This is a five megapixel camera. And I put the same creatures, the same rotifer on it. Um, and I blown one up here and notice that its body is really dark. Even though, remember it's like jelly, it's pretty clear, the body is clear here. The reason this is so dark is just like my salty alcohol. The small mm. change in index of refraction bends the light. And so you see a much higher contrast. Uh, and sometimes biologists, when they're using regular microscopes, they add a dye to enhance the contrast. Well, there's no dye. I just, these are right out of the jar. Um, so this microscope has a lot more um, sensitivity. It gives you a lot more contrast. Mm. Um, the other thing is there's no focus because there's no lens. Uh, so that, that makes it a lot easier to use. Um, so that's the one, so as you see, as the kid, I'm playing around with things, but as the adult, I'm also observing. The other part I wanna emphasize that's really important in inventing when I was a boy, I thought you had to do everything yourself or it was cheating. Well, as an adult, I know that's very much not true. That with teamwork, you can do things that you couldn't do yourself. So same thing here. I was very excited about this 
lensless microscope and I went to my colleague, Barton Smith at IBM. He was my manager. Um, and he said, well, that's pretty cool. You're using one light and you're seeing the shadows. What would happen if you had two lights? And you know how we have two eyes? So I have a little experiment for you to do. If you point to uh, my nose, that's a good target. We got a nice big nose. If you point to my nose on the computer screen, put your finger out and then close one eye and then close the other eye. Do you notice your finger shifts? The reason that shifting is you have two eyes, each see it from a different perspective. And your brain takes those two images together and creates a stereo model of what it's seeing. So Barton, being also an inventor, uh, he saw that I was basically making a microscope like with one eye. And what he realized is if we use two lights, two LEDs and alternated them. So we took a picture with the right LED and then the next frame, we took a picture with the left LED, we would get two images. And the higher the object is off the image chip, the further the shift would be just like um, when you uh, move your finger, the shift gets uh, larger. So what I have here is two frames of video and every frame, which is a picture, you know, a video is made out of lots of pictures. Right, right, right. Yeah. So this is the uh, first picture and these are for rotifer. And then I drew lines down so you could see where they should be. But when I, the next frame, I turned on the other LED. And you notice they shift, and that shift is proportional to how high they are off the image chip. So this is and kind so of like just, virtual reality. Uh, yeah, exactly. The reason why when you put goggles on, you need to have, you can't do virtual reality on a computer screen. You need to have a, basically a monitor for each eye. And that's why you wear goggles. So yes, yeah, so we took this microscope I thought of uh, just the lensless microscope with one LED and Barton added the idea of adding another LED so we could get stereo. And so we could actually then when we play it back through uh, head mounted displays, we could see like we were under the glass watching the plankton swim in 3D. So if I didn't talk to Barton, I would still have a mono microscope, which would have been cool but it is cool squared because I talked to Barton and he added his idea and we have a, we got a patent together. And when you get a patent, you have to name all the inventors and Barton did a very important contribution. So we have a patent together on this microscope. Um, this is the mono microscope because you don't have a virtual reality headset handy. So this is what the microscope looks like. And I poured all different samples of plankton on top. So let me start this from the beginning. I'm hoping this is what their um, cell phone microscopes will look like. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, this is uh, blepharisma, which is a plankton. Those are the big ones. Everything you see is plankton. These are still blepharisma. Uh, these are little fast creatures. Uh, I remember we called them did. There's a fancier name, but uh, oh, in the beginning there was a title of what they are. Um, this is a long plankton with a like a like an elephant nose. It yeah. it searches for food, and behind them are lots of tiny ones. This is another quick one. It has cilia, like a little mustache, and it uses them to propel itself, like you would swim with your arms. It has a little mustache that it wiggles called cilia. These are paramecium, a very popular um, uh, plankton that you can see with a microscope. This is an amazing cell. This is a stentor. It is one of the largest single cell organisms. It's almost a millimeter long. You could see it with your eye. And it's a single cell. This is a volvox, which is a a spherical uh, plankton. Frankly, I found 
biology boring when I was in high school because we just learned uh, the naming, naming all the parts of a flower. And I know people who love botany won't like to hear that. Uh, I respect what you, I, I respect your love for botany if you like flowers. Um, but to me, it was just memorizing uh, parts which I had no, no, no skin in the game, no interest in. And I've heard this from my friend who studied chemistry in high school. She said, all it, all it was was just memorizing terms. And language is like that too. You do need to learn the terms because you can't speak a foreign language if you don't know the word for shoe and, and banana and so forth. So you got to learn the vocabulary. But the fun is when you put sentence together and you talk to people, same in science, the fun is when you use those terms to talk to others about science. Um, so I, when I did this microscope, salt wasn't very interesting to look at. Um, but uh, so I looked up uh, what's, what's a good thing to look at in the sizes that I could see. And plankton was perfect and they swim in 3D. And then I learned about plankton, which fascinated me. Um, so here we have this microscope. And uh, as I say, the images are a little fuzzy because uh, when light hits an edge, it diffracts. And that's physics. You can't change physics. Anyway, so I went to UC Berkeley, which is a school in uh, Berkeley, California. And uh, there's a professor, Laura Waller there, and she runs a computational microscopy lab. And so I gave a talk on my microscope and I said, uh, well, I really like this because there's no lens, but the images are kind of fuzzy because of diffraction. And so they gave me a great advice. They said, if you wanna make your image better, you have to make it worse. And so I'll show you what they taught me. And again, this is the value of teamwork. I went to experts with my problem and they came up with a solution. Uh, so let's share their solution. And now it seems ironic. So this is, uh, this is my image chip. Uh, and instead of using a white LED, I used a red laser, which is about 30 cents. So uh, very inexpensive. And this is the image it produced. Remember I said, uh, if you have to make, if you wanna make the image better, you have to make it worse. These are uh, the diffractions from the creature from the, this is a paramecium. Uh, these are called fringes. And what this is, is, is called a hologram. And in 1947, Dennis Gabor uh, was working on electron microscopes to try and improve them. And he invented this technique of using a coherent light source where all the photons are synchronized. That's what a laser is. Um, think of a marching band and each of those is a photon and they're all marching together in line and in synchrony. That's what a laser does. Usually light is like a mosh pit where everyone's running around and or in kindergarten during recess, everyone's running around, bouncing around. That's what light usually is, very or unorganized. But a laser is very special. Uh, it takes all the light and gets them all lined up. And then, so when it comes out of the laser, they're moving like the marching band. So that's called coherent, very organized. And it makes this pattern, which looks awful, but it turns out you can mathematically reconstruct it. Um, so, uh, this is what happens when you do the reconstruction. You can actually calculate where the waves came from to produce this pattern. And this is what you get out of it, a much clearer image. That's why it, quote, looks worse because you have the object, but it's obscured by all the diffractions because every edge, every part of the creature that has some con difference between light and dark makes for a fringe. So all those fringes happen. But there's a fellow named Fourier, um, uh, and uh, he's a mathematician from last century. And what he figured out is, um, along with a lot of other physicists who studied light, this is about 500 years worth of research in light that produced this um, understanding. Um, if you have a, a little dot, a little, uh, the tiny little hole or uh, object, and the laser, laser hits it, it'll form rings. 
And so what the math basically does is says, I'm gonna see all the fringes that are produced. What object would have produced those fringes? And you, that's what the mathematical reconstruction does, figure out all the points in a plane that, caused the, that would cause these fringes. Here's another object. I was talking to uh, a, a professor, uh, Richard Thompson uh, from England, and he, invent, he, he coined the term microplastics. And he was telling me how they're all, all the fibers from our clothes, especially um, synthetic clothes like polyesters, every time you wash them, fibers come out. And that's, uh, if you've ever seen in a dryer, you have the lint trap. Well, in the washing uh, cycle, there's no lint trap. That water goes out ultimately to the ocean. Um, and those, are, those microfibers are actually getting uh, inside of plankton and other living, tiny living creatures. Uh, and it seems like that's, we're finding out that's harmful for them. So he got me interested in microfibers. And so uh, some of my students um, at uh, San Francisco State University are now studying microfibers. And it turns out this holographic microscope, uh, just the laser and the image chip is perfect for imaging microfibers. And that's what you're seeing here. Notice uh, you have this uh, straight line and then all the fringes. When you reconstruct it, this is the actual fiber. And one of my students uh, just uh, for their project, they figured out um, the curvy fibers are usually cotton and the straight ones are synthetic. That was one of their discoveries. Um, so this is a, a picture from one of the classes of my students actually building these microscopes. And these are biologists, but they're learning how to solder and drill and build things. So that's another thing. I remember I said, anything you learn is useful. And so I love teaching students electronics because it opens up a whole new world for them. So even though you're a biologist, if you're interested in biology, take a course in chemistry, which is really important for biology. Take a course in physics, uh, mathematics, anything you learn is useful. Yeah, I wanna address one thing. I, I talk to students a lot about science and how fun it is to be an engineer. And one of the most common things I hear is, oh, that sounds like you need a lot of math. And um, I'm not good at math, so I'm not gonna do science. And I see a lot of young people getting turned off uh, by science because they're afraid of math. Honestly, I find math very hard too. Uh, and in my work in computer science, uh, mostly I need algebra. Um, so that's kind of the most um, important for most programming. Of course, uh, in Fourier analysis, there are uh, their integrals and their um, uh, uh, other functions, which are much more complex. And honestly, um, that's where my skill kind of trails off, but that's where teamwork comes in also. So uh, I went to, as I say, UC Berkeley, and they provided me the algorithms that I could not figure out on my own. Um, I want to like, have a conclusion so uh, maybe we can finish here yeah i don't know what well, to, um yeah my bullets are stay curious uh be honest um follow your passion and the value of teamwork excellent thank you so much for your time i look forward to seeing you in the live session tomorrow um and we can have more of a chat students can ask, ask questions but Thanks. My pleasure. Nice talking to you, Jessica. All right. I'm going to go whip some plants. I got my weed whipper and we got tall grass and I'm tired of sitting and looking at a computer. So I'm going to get That's physical. a good idea. Yeah. yeah.